welcome everyone. Welcome Nuno. We welcome Shanti behind the curtain. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really, not only me, but so many people in this summit that you have helped organize and bring to life and, and change the life of so many people with. So many of us really wanted to listen to what you have to bring for, for, for us. And, and it was always delightful to hear you when you were holding the space and, and, and yeah, I was just very curious. So this is something very selfish I'm doing mainly for myself because I just want to know more about <laughs> your view of the world and what you've done um, to, yeah, to bring it more to life. So welcome Nuno da Silva. Um, I would like to start by you telling us a bit of your life. What, what, is, what, what are the highlights that you like us to know about what brought you to this moment in time? Hmm. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Chanti and Vita, for, for taking up this, uh, this challenge. And it really feels great to move from host to being uh, interviewed by you. It's, it's a, a gift. Thank you so much. Uh, um, that's an interesting question. And, uh, what I like about it, and one of the reasons I made it also a bit to, to the guest speakers was because we tend to think um, identity and who we are in a very rigid way. And I kind of got a lot uh, connected with the idea that we are, we are the ongoing becoming, you know, we are not like, like a fixed thing we are always in the in the move and so i i kind of got like that idea of thinking about some stepping stones because it offers a sense of of that flow i grew up in a very um low middle class working family in, in portugal very mononuclear so it's basically i was i'm the older son I later found out that actually there was a, a miscarriage uh, my mother had before me, so I was supposed to have an older brother, and I have a younger sister, four years and younger than me. So I'm the first graduate student of the family, and I grew up in this kind of very mononuclear, it was just my family and the, uh, my mother's uh, parents around. Um, so I always grew up longing for having people around and, and having uh, other kids to play, although I went to in kindergarten and that kind of stuff. So when I got in the, when I got to some, some interesting things, when I, when I was a teenager in my hometown, people always gathered in groups and they were very closed groups. And I always felt not good with that. I felt like a satellite. I wanted to move around, connect with different people. So I felt somehow a bit imprisoned in my hometown. And then I went to study economics in 92 in the south of Portugal. And that was the first big opening for me because I, it suddenly I got in a space with people from all over the country, from different fields of interest. And uh, I got very frustrated very fast with the way university was. For me, it felt like a, a bad version of high school in terms of uh, having homework and having very fixed ideas and people closed in boxes of... I was with economics in the economics uh, faculty. So I got bored with people around thinking all the same way about life and economics and wanting to talk about basic stuff like football and politics in a very basic way. So I got like very, this kind of very uh, crazy, hectic life of partying and talking with different people from different fields of study. And that, that transformed me a lot. I almost quit studying economics in the middle of it because it felt like this doesn't make any sense, what I'm learning, and was a very rigid way of thinking about economics. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad I, I kind of committed to do that. And it was a bit like, let's, I want to do this for the sake of you know, finishing the dream of my parents so that I kind of can go on with my life. And I'm happy of, to have done that because it, it was a stage of also being able to commit to something that was not necessarily my dream, but uh, to be able to take something until the end. And in the middle of it, I got involved in the youth movement within a local association uh, of arts and culture organized by young people for young people. 
And that was a second opening because suddenly it was like, okay, I, ca I can have an active role and not be passively criticizing society and thinking the world is going wrong and you know, leaving that frustration. And also together with that, so I got involved uh, in, in a, from a very you know, crazy place. I got involved like organizing uh, adventure sports because in that time I loved to do climbing and do all kinds of crazy stuff and looking for adrenaline. So it was this kind of feeling of life was boring. I needed to find also some other places to feel uh, more intensively alive. And the, I ended up in 98 or participating in the first international exchange of, uh, uh, for me. With, and I found out that actually there was these programs in Europe, uh, funded by European Union where you could meet other young people from different parts of the world and from different parts of Europe and work on having conversations on things that matter to you. So I got in, I was, I went, instead of doing this kind of um, uh, last year travel that everybody goes to, you know, Costa Rica or to one of these fancy tropical places uh, to have fun before starting the working life, I went to a, an exchange uh, with, with people from all over Europe in Sweden about racism and xenophobia which was something very alive in my family. My sister had just started a, a relationship with a black guy and we find out that our family was actually having some racist um, attitudes that we didn't know before because uh, they always told us to, to, as we grow up that everybody's the same and should be treated fairly equally. But when it comes to family, things change a bit. And so that was very painful for us to go through. And I ended up getting involved very much in that network. I, and then when I finished, the, the interesting thing is that when I finished college and I started working in the business field, after one, very quickly, after one and a half years working there, I just felt like this is not, not meaning, bringing meaning to my life. And I dropped a kind of very promising career as a, a project investment manager and, uh, and uh, kind of manager of the company towards uh, working, receiving much less, but working in the, as a project coordinator in this network of youth organizations that were working for peace education and human rights and intercultural learning and things that really mattered to me. And I ended up working then as secretary general. Then in 2005, I became president of the whole network and started this work as a freelance educator because I found out that actually my call to shift the world was from a place of rethinking like what is it that we need to learn today to deal with the world we are living in and obviously school was not giving us that and so because I always felt like education I was coming at education from the place of, of transformation so from the place of education as a process not, not as an end in itself not as a place to help people adapt to the world as it is, but actually for people to be active agents of co-shaping, co co-creating the world towards what they would like to bring to life. Yeah. And, and that has been my work mainly within, uh, after 2005, I worked a lot as a freelance educator, training people to work with participative, interactive methodologies, uh, what we call in Europe non-formal education. Mm -hmm. In America would be in the in the South America would be popular education and there's different names for it. Uh, but even that space was becoming more and more very uh, standardized with you know uh, uh, indicators of success and parameters and all sorts of stuff that make a practice uh, dead. And then and then uh, I started also, the, the funny thing is I was feeling like a, a wave spread all over the place, traveling around and doing all sorts of very exciting stuff, having, having a, he a heck of a life, really. Mm. For, from my humble, you know, um, background, that was, uh, this is the life. But something in me started to feel this is not enough. Uh, I wanted to be more place-based, almost like, being a wave wanting to become a particle, you know, like being place-based, being um, uh, feeling the, the resistance and the, and the benefits also of, of being committed to a place and to a people. Mm. Because this was a very 
uh, free, sometimes nihilistic kind of life. You know, you go there, you pretend to be important to do others and to do meaningful work, but you actually don't see the impacts of it and you are not committed on a long term with it. Mm. So it's very easy to, to create all sorts of narratives. And particularly what started to be present to me was this kind of, that I was living this kind of hero's journey thing. I'm going to have to save the world. And something I, I always felt in me was this call for something bigger than me, mm. which is something mysterious. I don't know where it comes from, but it was always kind of a side with me it's just like a voice telling you can do you one day you'll do big things and i think part of that might be my ego saying uh, you know you want to be relevant and to the world and be recognized part of it might be just a mystery of this kind of drive this force that propels me to do things in the world then i created a cooperative with some friends in 2009 in portugal to kind of meet this aspiration of being localized, but the whole thing was on my back. Everybody was expecting me to be the driving force on it. And I just wanted to be among equals doing work. Mm. And, and because it was not flowing in that way, I started to look around to see to, to, as ways to escape that, to find other work. And I applied to a job in the Council of Europe, which looked like in that time, this is the job, this is the place I could give most of me but I was not uh, selected. And then an, an opportunity opened up to go for four months to work in Timor-Leste with the World Bank and the Ministry of Education. And I just went like, okay, this, I'm going for this and experiment. And I ended up staying there four years. Mm. And it was a very particular moment in my life because I just had an experience before that that for the first time opened up for me this work around shadow the shadowy aspects of myself and allowed me to really be at peace with aspects of me that I used to not like because I always tend to like to, to please people and to have people uh, appreciating me. So I tend to put things that I think people are not going to like aside. And from that moment on, I got in the space of really feeling free to, you know, uh, also, also do mistakes and do bad things, and but be in a place of uh, willing to recognize when I, that happens. Mm. So much more liberated, which I think was really important for me. I end up meeting my wife in Timor. Uh, the work there was the, the end of a process of, um, of decolonization of my of ingrained ideas about mm. development, about how the world should be. Uh, and about different narratives that were still playing inside of me about these narratives of separation and scarcity. And I came back to Europe in 2014 looking for where are the seeds of change, where are the, the, the places that I can connect with that can um, bring hope for a better future. And I got involved in permaculture, transition, movement, different kind of things. And that has led me to another process of big shift because imagine like uh, I got through this phase of uh, after young adult where you try to find your place in the world. I found my place with non-formal education, being recognized uh, educator. And so I had like, a, I, had, I, was, I had recognition, I had opportunities, I had gained my space in the world. And then suddenly it was like, this is not, exactly it and having to drop that comfort and all that things and be in a place of struggling with not knowing for a long period of time mm. because it was between around 2011 2012 up until 2016 so i think i'm still in that I, I never left that but i got more clarity as as i moved forward uh was very strong because it was a big shift i i kind of start to question even more things in me and um and that's what led me to most of the work I'm doing today. It sounds pretty much like a hero's journey anyway, in, in so many <laughs> ways, because it's like, I have the feeling, and that's, this is my interpretation, of course, of the hero journey as well, that you're coming back to, you know, the hero tends to come back to his or her home. And, and, and it's like you, you had that, all those experiences of putting yourself out there and then and you coming back to yourself. And, and doing the transformation in yourself as well, which 
it's almost inevitable. And one thing I really appreciate from what you're saying is that, you know, it's like what you were saying that you had your place in the world, but that's not enough. And then maybe that recognition of there is no one place in the world because we are changing all the time. The world is changing all the time. And that's, you know, bringing you somewhere else, perhaps yeah. in a place of discomfort, but, you know, growing, which is, is it has its conflicts, of course, but um, yeah. I'm very, interesting. Very, very grateful that you, you've gone through what, that. One thing that your, your uh, feedback kind of brings to me is somehow it's like um, one of the main uh, dramas and challenges of being a human is we've, we've, grow, we've evolved with this kind of radial, um, in this radial way, like we had like our head is round, it's, our body is made to hold the head or what. But, but our body is stretching out into the world. So we've spread, we've came a long way from being waterly creatures towards being, you know, going around the earth and really spreading all over the place. Mm. So I think our drama in a way is like, how, how, what is home for us? You know, and that's, that's definitely part of my life's journey. Like, where is home? What, what is home? How to make a home? Uh, and I think particularly in this period of time, that's a big question for us uh, mm. as humanity. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, and I also feel that you've been um, something that I really appreciate in, in, in your journey is that, you know, things, things were there. You were looking for something and then you got a bit of it, but it wasn't enough. So you made your own ways. Like when, when, when you started interacting with the people at universities, okay, this is, this is kind of the direction. But then once you're there, you notice, no, I need to do something more. I mean, instead of joining something else, you start being the active person making your own path. And I can yeah. see that in all, in all what I've read from you and, and what I've seen, this is kind of, um, to me, that's kind of a story arc in your life. It's you making things happening and happen, yeah. and not just trusting that somebody else is going to do it for you, which has the drawback that then people yeah. expect you to do it. So not, not only that, I think other things you have, I mean, you have more what I've been noticing and particularly around people who are pioneers somehow in bringing new ideas or new ways of doing and being is when you are when you start that when you are like on the beginning of that it's almost like when you go on a jungle and you have like to you know open the the, the field and others will later collect the, the rewards so it's a place of uh, of uh, long, big challenges mm. and uh, for me it has been also a challenge in one of the things we were talking before we started the recording which is around my own challenges with routine and with habits because I tend to be very um, uh, restless, you know, of long, trying to always, always thinking new things, not able to, to be on the same thing for a long time. And so there's, there's a lot of, there are several drawbacks in that, that I'm kind of trying to reconcile now. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you, and and very grateful that yeah you, you you do the hard work for us as well. So yeah, hat off <laughs> to you. Um, uh, I'm not the only one. There's many. No, no, that that would be horrible if it would be on, only on your shoulders. I wouldn't wish that for you at all. Um, yes, would you like to add something else about how how the last kind of what, what I mean, I... brought you into the summit? What? Perhaps so. One thing I want to say before that that I I, of, I think often we we fail to to acknowledge is not everything was a personal choice or uh, and and definitely most of it was not a, a, a having a sense of this is what I want to get at it was just a feeling every now and then of. Uh, taking a choice, considering what was most truthful for me in that moment. Mm. And I often experience pressure from people around of, of being clear that because people want, you know, like clear plans. And, and, I, and I always felt like I know that I'm going somewhere and that what I'm, the choices I'm making make sense. Mm. 
maybe they are not obvious now. And so I always had that kind of deep trust. But for instance, I lost my father in a very unexpected way with a heart attack. And I had a, a difficult relationship with him uh, for several reasons. And his loss was a profound experience for me. And it was already like almost 20 years ago because it, it made me feel really intensively in a real, in a real physical way how, how fragile life is, which is something I knew, but you know, you don't, you don't, my father was the second person I've lost in with the big um, uh, bonds after my grandfather, which was most probably one of the persons I loved most in the mm -hmm. world. And when he, when he, when my father died, it was a bit like, oh man, is we cannot lose any opportunity we have in any moment to bring forward what what we are experiencing and particularly to say to people what you have to say and i think that kind of connects a bit i think with what you've experienced lately dita that some having the opportunity to say to 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 come to a place of peace with someone before he departs or she in terms of saying what you have to say and and you know doing the things you have to do with the person in a place that you feel at peace with that loss is so important. Mm. And we've, I think our society neglects that because of the way we relate with death. And in my case, I didn't have that opportunity. So it was a bit like I remember to be with, with him in the chapel with his body and just, you know, falling apart, crying and just saying, I promise to honor your, the gift you gave me of life to, you know, not lose this opportunity again and to be really mindful of it and take this precious gift uh, in, a, in a more serious and serious in, the, in terms of commitment, right, uh, mm -hmm. way. Now, yeah, that was important because many times our lives are shaped by these events that is just the way yeah, it absolutely. is. Absolutely, yeah. I think I, I had, I'm happy that, that I made that, that I had that in me, that energy already to be aware of that when in that moment which helped me go through the pains of, of losing him. Um, the summit comes from, so in 2018, I've, I've been wanting to be involved in the transition network for some time. I, 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 I'm very much resonate with the idea of, you know, of uh, coming together in, in your place and with others and trying to start to, to contribute to the shift to this transition and not expect politicians and other people to do the work. And um, in 2018, I, well, it's worth saying that I tried to do that in my own town. It didn't work because that was one of the things that I didn't found people have wanting to have the conversations mm -hmm. and doing the things I wanted to do back in 2014. And that led me to search for those kind of conversations and people outside of my place and that led to work more on this kind of virtual means mm. but also on in contact with people from different parts of Portugal so I got involved in the Portuguese hub of transition and because I already had this kind of very uh, developed sense of uh, contributing to networks and having always that the work I'm doing always having that view of the larger scale of things so I'm, I, that's one of my gifts also that I'm able to move from local and very particular to the large and very and more abstract and hold that. Um, so I got involved in 2018 in a little group uh, convened by Claire Mims and uh, Claire Mime and uh, Eva uh, that was commissioned by the hubs uh, to, of the transition movement to work on uh, some offers around conflict because mm. there was different levels within the movement mm. that were struggling with conflict. Mm. And we spent a year having conversations online, me and uh, four, five ladies about what is, I mean, it's important to say that because mostly were ladies, women that have this kind of sensibility. Mm. And... Uh, and we were exploring like what it, what it's what is the what are why are we struggling with conflict and what we could offer and we came up with this idea to do a one year program with 
online offers of uh, webinars and workshops with different practices that we felt could be relevant for people to to engage with and that was that was what came out of after that year 2018 and then because of my own struggle so and and the group wanted me to be coordinating and moving that work forward uh, but I, I uh, my life situation in that moment didn't allow that to happen so it kind of without anybody's um, responsibility it got, kind of got a bit frozen mm. on the beginning of 2019 and then my life shifted again and when i went back to timor with the family in september i i contacted the the group and said like if you still think i'm i'm the right person to do this i think i have the space to do it now and they felt yes the transition network felt the same so in november i started working on it and mm. in that time it felt like Starting a, an offer of once a month or twice a month, it's going to be another program. People are not going to be, I mean, there's, it's going to be hard to, to take off and to have people engaged in this. So I thought maybe to start off with a big event where we bring different voices and we make that a kind of a happening might, um, might be a good way to start and to create momentum, you know. Also because within the transition movement, another thing that is worth mentioning is the, the, always there's this kind of polarization between inner work and outer work. So mm. people dri driven to act in the world, which I think is the dominant force, dominant energy in the movement, but also people recognizing that mostly women, but not only recognizing that we need to do a inner work, both individually and collectively to sustain and to kind of, work with the, bring that transformation on the outside mm. and those need to go hand in hand but also some people really felt just i think this is more important mm. than work and so there's this kind of uh, conflict. Tension, mm. tension conflict between them and um i thought like it started all with let's do a week with you know, inviting guests, uh, having conversations. We re pre-record conversations with different people we feel have uh, something valuable to share and then have uh, host conversations with the participants and see how that can inform form us about what, what to do next instead of, you know, defining already in advance without knowing exactly what could be of service. Mm. Um, now that that idea evolved beyond what was expected because then it started to emerge this movement of the need to touch into the problematic ways we see conflict mm. uh, looking at other ways of seeing that could be more of service and then looking at the practices and then towards more the end of, of the recording interviews actually was in a conversation with Ali Middleton kind of when I was still think, figuring out if she wanted to be interviewed or not, that she kind of raised that question of, you know, uh, the opening and the closing are as important as the rest. And, and I sit with that because I knew that, in, uh, you know, unconsciously, but I, I didn't came to me that that was important. And that's mm -hmm. why suddenly one week became three weeks and then three weeks became five weeks because we felt like, well, opening the summit and closing is as important as everything else. And then, so Eva was with me, with me from the beginning, but then because I got, I got some uh, funding from November, I got more on the lead. Then she, we got some funding also for her to work a bit and she got in. And then I knew Ben from other places and, and in a conversation, I, I told him like, what, what, would you, what would you feel about this? And because he was doing Now What in April, we, thought, we felt that maybe the summit could take place there, but then with all the story of COVID, the things got late and we ended up doing afterwards. But Ben got involved naturally in the process. And so thankfully, because he really brought, he, he brought the energy and the know-how the know mm. to complement us and bring this kind of participatory element into it, which was fundamental. And... Uh, myself i was just so drained by all the the other work that i felt i couldn't hold that so it was just like this is such a blessing and that's how the summit came to a place and then we actually have to put hold on it because you know the, the more you call people in and the, the we were doing it in a way that 
we always conver conversed with the guest speakers that this is not a one-off thing. We actually want the, the main intention is to create relationships and to see how this can move us forward in collaboration possibilities. Mm. Uh, so there was always this sense of nurturing relationships and that allowed people also to feel the relevance of the work and trust in the, the space we are holding. And so they pointed us to other people and they, in a certain moment was like, okay, is it enough? Because we obviously know that 40, more than 40 interviews, it's way too much. I know. So we also thought like, let's make this in a, in a way that it, this stays there and it's available for people to do in, in their own rhythm. So the summit is uh, hosted by us, it's just the starting point. And then this will open many things. So let's see what comes up. And we were taken, we were, in many ways we were taken by surprise how much people, you know, um, yeah, stepped forward and took, took the place. You, Chanti, I mean, so many others. Um, took the, the space and start to make it their own and, and mm. uh, offer think, things also. I think that's largely because of the way you set it up as well. So it just, it, there, was, there was not only the invitation, but I personally, and I think I can speak for others as well, we all felt very comfortable um, and not, there was a safe space that you created where mistakes were just seen as part of the process and a part of learning. So it's, it's been incredibly, um, validating for for me and and for i think for many others as well so it was really beautiful yeah i think and part of it is because of the the way we've be we've managed to keep connected with the intention and what what where which place you were bringing this from and wanting to be authentic and not be you know sometimes the, the pressure to or the tendency to to be professional in the very in a certain kind of aesthetics and way of being uh, prevent us from, from inviting others into a place where you said, where you can just be yourself because mm -hmm. we just want to show the best we can show of ourselves and of what we can bring to the world and that detaches from who we really are in the moment. And I think we tried that with interviews. For me, it was, was it's interesting now to watch some of them because I can also see my own arch of ev evolution in, in you know, the way I start to be more comfortable, start to bring different things. And also now, like, looking at if I would do now, I would do it from another, a totally, in a totally different way, which There's, is also interesting. You're probably a different person now as well from yeah, that person there. So I, I remember I, I, I was I was re this is this is a beautiful moment for me as well because that, that first ceremony, uh, the opening ceremony, um, the first ever breakout group that I was in part of the summit was with you. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was my, my initiation, so to speak, to the summit. And I, I, I was just like, oh my God, this is so nice and so comfortable. And you know, it was it was just very, very beautiful. And I remember uh, from that, not from our conversation, but from that uh, first um, you speaking to people and somebody was asking, so what do you expect? What, what, is, what is the intention of the summit? What, what, what are you expecting to have at the end? And you said something that I found like, okay, this is the right place for me to be. Is that you said there is no intention. We have no expectation for, for a product or for, a, for an outcome. We are just kind of seeing what emerges. and. I, f I feel that that's especially in the in in the context of conflict that is such a it's been such a revelation for me as well is that if we go with an open mind and with a without this this idea of oh we need to feel different or or but just open then things can co arise co emerge and or how how it's been also named to have this collective genius which I think has been quite in, quite important in the summit. Nevertheless, I would love to, to know now, after the summit, what, what, what if, is there something that is really present for you that the summit has kind of brought you or, or left you with? Oh, it's so many things. It has been really rich and um, together with some other spaces I'm involved, it has been fundamental to for me to make sense of, of um, 
what what it what it's needed what is what are we being called for in this particular moment in in human history where it's you not know, like we just live in this huge unknowing and you know in the sense that um that yeah the ways we've been in the world have, have been bringing uh, a lot of uh, suffering and destruction so what is it that we need to take one of the things that actually is related with just, what you just said and uh, is it became clear for me this kind of um, a notion of uh, what what I call a, a triad way of, of seeing things or a, the, this it could almost be like the holy trinity of, of Christianity or I think it's the same in other religions so there's this sense that you always have this kind of uh, dual forces playing out in the world and in us, right? And and we kind of we we want to bring things to life that we believe, but we also want to avoid suffering. You know, darkness and light, day and night, uh, all these kind of polarities, which I think is in a way what generates dynamics and movement, right? Mm. Uh, but uh, it's very easy to get to get uh, um, stuck in you know in that kind of very um, bidirectional or or uh, two dimensions kind of thinking, and you either are this or that, or you either uh, your opinion needs to be in one one of one side. And what I'm feeling is there's this kind of, so if you look at that, you can say like, there's always a activating force and a restraining force. Mm. There's always in us something that pulls us to wake up in the morning and go do something in the world and something that invites us or asks us to be quiet and don't do anything. And I guess that's part of, of being human, but there's something more into that there's actually a possibility for the reconciling force, for something that brings those two together. And the three of them make a whole. It's not like you stop working with the others. It's just that you can go on a different place. And I think part of what we experienced in the summit and part of what will be called maybe in conflicts is how we can hold space to allow that mysterious force because it's something we don't fully understand. It's like, where does this come from? It's not, it's not in us. So it's not something like I say, this is the force I put in the world. It's more like a willingness or a, a enabling it to come, not bringing it to life, which is different. You know, it's enabling, it's allowing ourselves to go to a certain gesture in us and around us so that those forces play in us and, and kind of reveal something else that is, was not there before to come mm. to life. And those can be very unique ideas that were just coming out in the world and that bring things to a new level of new order of complexity and of understanding, which I think is, if we think about the world these days, like the level of technology and of uh, things we are creating that have a potential, a huge potential of destruction. I mean, I, somehow it's like unavoidable. We cannot stop that drive, that energy. So we have on one side this kind of very destructive energy in us at, at our, at our uh, will, at our, uh, you know, available for us to use. And our consciousness is still, you know, very far from being able to hold that. So. I think instead of restraining this and saying you need to stop or you need to go back to primitive ways of living, it's like how we can raise our consciousness to a way in a way that is able to hold this potential because the potential for bringing life and also bringing destruction is there. Mm. Uh, and I think part of that is just working with this mysterious triad of of polarization and then how to overcome that and i think that's very visible in the states where you see us being at the growing tendency to to kind of fragment society and put people up against and in favor of things we've been we've seen that in the past and we know that that can generate very destructive forces so how we can hold space together for something else to emerge that is not about 
being in favor or against. Mm. And it's also kind of for me, and I think for for the cultures I've I've, I've been living in, it's it's a fundamental association we have with conflict. So conflict, and we we already the language that we use to define it is talks about parties and and you know having two sides of the conflict and 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 conflict resolution will just be like how do we bring those two parts together and then what i really find fascinating is to then yeah that try a thing of okay there's there's not necessarily that or or why is it there or you know coming at it with a different uh perspective a different kind of paradigm or or, or even without a paradigm it's just like yeah, that's something, so, something we cannot explain. I like that. I like that we don't know that it's mysterious. That it's you, just... you touch on one thing, you know, because I do think in order to, in order to allow that force to come in, um, to enable us to be to be, you know, uh, uh, vehicles for for it to come to life, we do need to do a lot of work on. Our, on our own selves in terms of being really observing and clear about what kind of part of mental frames, what kind of frameworks are we um, are, are we using to hmm. see the to, 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 to or are we using or are we or are, from from which mental models from which frameworks are we understanding and thinking about what we are observing about reality? Because again, if in a conflict, if you tend to look at it from this very, um, you know, separative perspective of the world and of competition and scarcity, of course you want to you you'll want to win the fight. You want yeah. to win the, the the conflict. You know, uh, you you get you get slave of these other forces that are alive in us of wanting to be recognized, of wanting to be right, of you know of. Um, of having that self-assurance that it comes from being the, the self-righteous one. So there's all sorts of energies playing that we might become slaves and that are related also with our mind, with our mind maps, with our mental mm. frameworks. So be doing the work of being more and more aware of which framework I'm using to understand reality. And we are always using, we cannot, it's like, that's another uh, kind of, uh, of, of, uh, a burden we have and a gift because frameworks can help us see the world in uh, make sense of the world and something we always need to be doing in order to navigate through it uh, and nowadays we are invite being invited to how can i be uh, more clear of what is the framework i'm using so that i can see if it's really serving to understand mm. reality and uh, and to bring uh, to life what i want to bring if not, maybe I need to start to be in those places of not, not knowing and starting to be it's just like a child, you know, like a ch child when you come out in the world from the belly of the mother. I can imagine it's quite painful because mm. it's just like all these stimulus, very confusing, and you take time to, to make sense of it and to find the patterns. So I think we need to go through that also, to mm. go through that confusion and uh, em embrace it and, you know, and just be like, having those that bit of chaotic sense of I don't get it what's going on and and then by listening to each other and bringing and, and allowing the voices that need to be expressed to come forward uh, then uh, I think there's a chance we might be allowing something new to come in, mm. in, in us. so there's always this kind of uh, there's another way to call it is like death and resurrections like we always need to die a part of us needs to die in order for something new to come to life yeah, it's part of nature as well one part that we tend to forget is just all the decay and and, and death mm -hmm. that we just want everything to be clean and stuff and yeah i, I like i like i like the idea of the the way i've always seen it is, is a map we have a map of ourselves or a map of reality which is really helpful and I think the trick that you are naming it, it kind of the, the way I understand it is to not never forget that this is just a map. So never forget that it's a framework of something else and that the framework is something we can change. So that, uh, yeah, I, I really like that. And I think it's just yeah, that, also very that helpful. 
that is that kind of work that all religions mention about of, of the observer like who who is the observer who is you know if we do meditation or this kind of exercises we've done today when we get together of just spending some time in silence and connecting to what is what is it that i'm observing in me mm. so there's this kind of yeah there's this place there's this space in us that a lot that can observe things without getting attached to them so there's something also interesting to to explore each mm. one of us like what is it because we are not you know we are not what we like and what we don't like and those things are uh, came through us from from living life and uh, they are they are impermanent but there's yeah. something there that is kind of um, always there's that capacity to observe without attachment yeah that, that uh, would which, be which i think buddhists mention that as a, as the way to free ourselves from suffering i'm not there yet because i don't know that's a, an interesting dilemma to explore. I'm, I don't know if I want to get rid of suffering. Also, in the sense that I felt, I feel these days that all the emotional in, uh, expressions uh, of, that humans have are uh, useful in our navigation of the world. So it's not like to attract pain or suffering, but to recognize that they inform us somehow. So instead of trying to avoid them, like look to them and be with them and just kind of sense. And I think that's something that came up, for instance, in the work with people from possibility management. First, that you start to be really clear about what are the main emotions at stake. And I, I found a very interesting work from Dalai Lama with this guy, Paul Enkman, which is mm. a world expert on emotional human emotions. They made the atlas of emotions that is available online where you can see <clears throat> the main emotions like this joy, um, sadness, anger, and fear, and all the other palette of emotions come from combinations of those. And if we start to be more working uh, in ourselves and with each other of being able to recognize how these emotions uh, uh, emerge in us and, and where the, how that all dynamics play, that will be very helpful for us to be individually and collectively more clear of what needs to be worked with. Yeah. And it's in relationship. It's not something I do alone. It's not that it's new age, which tends to be problematic because it says you, need, you just need to think positively. <laughs> That's putting people in a very miserable state because there's a mystery in that definitely if you focus on what you want to bring to life, you feel that's where the energy is. But you need to do that knowing also, being aware that you always try to avoid what brings you pain. And mm. so being mindful of that and paying attention also to what brings you pain and, and what you might be doing to avoid that is also helps you to make a choice at mm. each moment. Am I being stuck in what they call the, the team from possibility management, being hooked? Am I being hooked by these emotions and trying to do everything I can to not experience them? Or am I in a place that I pay attention and I recognize them, but I still make a choice to bring what I want to bring to life in that moment? Mm. So yeah. That was something that came through for me. And, and I see a certain connection again with, uh, with conflict. So th there was this... Um, so like... The, the, the emotions that we, our society deems as, as bad, like, you know, pain and, and grief and, and, and anger and all that might be just po like you were saying, pointing to something that needs attention. And then I was wondering, um, so is, is that a bit like conflict being kind of a, either a sign or something that can be used for like shaping the world that you are hoping to build so do you use that is that your experience that you can use conflict to actually guide you in the world that you are building yeah yeah and i can say that in a very uh, real practical sense in my own life so i've been and i've been in a process throughout the summit but that has been longer of, of uh, big conflict tensions in my relationship in my family uh, bo both with my kids and with my wife. And I think, I mean, I got 
very easily uh, hooked by the dynamics of it and you know by often pointing the finger at the other as the, the responsible for for things not going good or for what I was experiencing and what I've been noticing and by doing this work is that I'm more in a, more and more in a place and I've evolved to be in a place of uh, the starting point was recognizing my capacity or my inability to show up in a different way but starting to recognize that there's something here that is not about uh, me or you or us is about the, the relationship and that's something that needs to be noticed mm. and it actually it's, it's interesting because it's something about the relationship but it's something actually about the world at large because it's about my uh, up, upbringing and my relation with my parents most probably of the generations before so there's this sense of how ancestrality has, has played a role in how I am today, but also in the sense of the culture at large, that there's a, there's a, a field in the social culture, in, in the culture at large, that also uh, kind of um, get me stuck in certain dynamics of what it kind of means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and what it, mm. needs to be a, what it means to be a father. What, and so the conflict has been... Uh, an invitation has been there and if I if I'm staying with it and I'm working with it now to kind of see how the, it informs me about my own dynamics and about all these other things that are, are not about me but that are coming through me because it's very easily in the in the current society to put everything on the individual and to just say everything is my own fault and is my own deed and in a way it's a paradox because it's a, it's a yes and no. It's like I have the responsibility or the, the potential to break up with some of these dynamics, some of these patterns, but I'm not necessarily the one who created them. Mm. I mean, I've, I've just been swimming in that water and now I, I have a choice to, to learn how to swim in a different way or to maybe change the water or to be part of the change of the water. And that's very interesting for me because it opens this space of I'm, I'm, conflicts are always going to be part of life and I'm always going to be, you know, bumping up against the wall and, uh, and, and feeling the pains that come with it. But I do know now that every time that happens, there's something in me and in the world that is calling for attention, is calling for is opening up a, another possibility. It's an invitation also to look there and then think like, what is the third force the, enabling that third force to come in, you know? Mm. Which doesn't mean that you're always going to be, it's not a resolution or fixing things. I, it might be that my relationship is beyond fixing and, and I have to go through that pain. Uh, but there's a, a possibility here on one side that it might be sorted and if not, that at least that I might become more aware and enable something new to come in me and therefore also to come in the world. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for, for sharing that as well. I'm, I'm sadly aware of the time. Um, and I was wondering if Shanti, I, I have some other things. I, I mean, I could just go on for hours, really. Um, <laughs> It's so beautiful to finally have time, unlimited or oh, less limited time to listen to you. But maybe Shanti wanted to ask something um, still, or oh, she's putting something in the chat. She's saying, go oh. ahead. All right. Um, oh, I wanted to bring the puppet. Shanti's here. Shanti, you want something? Anyway. Um, <laughs> another, mo another one for the bloopers. Um, I think one of the things, while you think about it, uh, that, that, that came through that I think is worth mentioning is uh, the collective dimension of this work that I think the summit brought uh, this deep sense that I think that's one of the shortcomings of the hero's journey is that it's focused on a hero and, and maybe the, the new uh, mythology we want to bring in is a collect that the collective is a collective journey. Yeah, and, uh, we are all we are all part of it, and so this sense of community of the need to be together in this space of not knowing and supporting each other and 
and just uh, recognizing that each one of us has a unique gift to bring to the world is so important these days, particularly in this time where, you know, disruption also can pull us to very destructive places in us and around us, how we can hold space so that that rage, have rage clubs and, and, uh, and grieving ceremonies and rituals where we can process all the pain that we are suffering, that we are experiencing that is the pains of the world in mm. the way it is also in this in this process of transformation it's almost like going through the birth channel you know it's going to be painful but it's something new will come out of this as long as we are able to hold space otherwise if you want to you know the energy of of, of uh, activism of uh, against and of putting more energy in the world and this kind of pushing and pulling is part of uh, is is almost like wanting to make uh, births controlled medical births, which we know are not um, good. Are traumatic. The they are traumatic. Are traumatic. Mm. Definitely, I know. I as a father, I know where my kids grow up. Uh, my kids came out in a, a C-section because basically the whole system didn't uh, made all sorts of stuff that didn't allow the birth to go through naturally as it should have so i carry that trauma in me mm. i'm sure my kids and my, my wife definitely more than more than me even so there's this sense of how we can hold space together on going through this it's fundamental and the summit reinforced that that feeling in me yeah that's uh, i i resonate very much with what you're saying as well um, I'm tempted to end it in such a beautiful way, but still, I'm, I'm going to bring my agenda <laughs> of, so you've had so much experience with so many different, um, you, it's like you've lived different lives in very different environments. And I see the kind of a story arc of, of, you know, bringing communication and bridging things and bringing a new perspective or, or, or no perspective. So, you know, um how how do we make this available to the people who don't know yet that they need this it's like uh, i know that part part of what the emergence uh, network is doing is, is also that making it vocal making it available to everyone but still it's as if we need the enlightenment of individuals in order to make this available and i'm maybe i'm more in a rush or i'm just feeling there's no time so what's your experience can we bring these all these ideas that you've mentioned and the things we've seen in the summit can we bring these to say a business meeting or or a corporation so another thing that at the same time i was organizing the summit i've done was um, a, a course training on uh, regenerative uh, development with Regenesis. One of the persons I interview in the summit, uh, Joel Glansberg, is, was one of the teachers. And they've done an amazing work. They have like more than 20 years of working with regenerative development. So they work, in, with, for instance, with the framework of the law of three, this, this uh, triad. And they work with other frameworks that I think are really helpful to uh, the, to kind of think like how to bring uh, regenerative development in us and around us. And w so there's a couple of things in here. One is everything that is alive is, as a dev is going through a development process, right? And we know this from birth, growth, uh, you know, reaching the apogeo and then decay, death, and, and then again. And so this, this, this is like a cycle of uh, the most basic cycle of development that a living being takes. But mm. there's other developmental aspects of it, right? So all of us are in development state, in a development in our lives. And I think part of, the, of the, what's coming up for me really strongly with that work is to see that instead of looking at things as problems, to shift the gaze towards potential. So if you think everybody, everybody around us is in a certain place. And mm -hmm. if, we, if, if what we want to do, and I think we often get stuck in trying to convince others that we are somewhere ahead in some place and we want to bring them to, to our place because we know we are right. 
And I think that kind of gesture doesn't help. So there's another way to look at this, which is to accept people where they are, to really respect. I mean, this person has gone through a lot in their lives. They are where they are. And, and so first, I think gesture is to uh, understand and accept and to, to try to understand more why you are where you are instead mm. of trying to make it different, you know, or to fix it. Or to... So to be within that open, open place of curiosity and, and open heart to others. And I think through that, we might be able to also see potential to see whether well, this person could definitely, you know, um, go through uh, different things that would help her shift the gaze. Like on, on, the, on the session I made on, the, on, on, on uh, the first session I made as a facilitator of regenerative development was one week and a half ago. And we were talking about this shift from problems to potential and the shift from looking at inter initiatives and projects as we, want a, we have a dream and a vision and we are going to put that out in the world mm -hmm. to kind of freeze that a little bit and to go through, okay, what is the place I'm living in and I want to intervene? What is the, what is the place trying to express? Looking at its history, like where it is now, how people sense, how people experience the place. They are living in and trying to get a sense of the unique essence of the place. Like what is the unique thing this place has to give to the world and what is the potential? So where it could go forward in terms of, of you know, manifesting this, this uh, uniqueness and this essence. So starting from a different place that is kind of decentering us from the, from the scene and kind of putting the place mm. at the center. And I think that's with other things the same, like um, what it means if we put, the other at the center and uh, see where he, where he or she is at and then think like how I can contribute in a place that is not intrusive or not, you know, penetrating like this kind of very patriarchal way of thinking or of being and be more in a, what I, what I think is a feminine way, more receptive mm. towards where the person is. And that I think is with the world in general. I mean, it's very easy to to put the blame on Trump, but I'm sure Trump had a had a hell of a bad of a, of a traumatic uh, upbringing that led him to be this sociopath. And recognizing, for instance, that the systems we have in place have incentives for sociopaths to get in places of power. So that brings us to another way, which is seeing like not that the system is out there and that is, mm. probably, but how, like how I also have these elements in me. And I see this in others and how we can start working together to shift that in a way that is not about blaming or judgments, but really of, of love and caring and, 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 you know, being sympath sympathetic that we all, I, I mean, I, there's things in my family that cause me a lot of pain uh, in the way my mother is and uh, in the dynamics of between my mother and the other members of the family and myself and but i'm kind of getting a place of more and more learning to love them for what they are and respect where they are and the respect that they have their own development process and yeah. it sometimes is not as fast or as clear as as i, I would uh, wish for but it, it is their own and so i think that's part of it instead of having this kind of very reactive um, activism, how can we have another one? I remember like uh, Extinction Rebellion has been quite inspiring for me in many ways, mm. in some of the aspects of the movement. And there's some of the gestures that comes with it. I remember my colleague, Tony Spencer from the Emergence Network, who kind of started to bring this kind of the pause that you would have in the middle of this row and people row and being against or just to just have a pause and connect with what is, what is alive in me in this moment? What is coming up in this kind of particular uh, moment where I'm here occupying a bridge, making some sort of resistance? What is it that I want to bring to life? What mm. is it that I want to let go of? You know, tuning into that more inner aspect, I think is a big shift in terms of what we're, we're talking about. And that in itself might be more transformational than screaming at you know fighting against and some of the things i've seen people do with police in front with really like police brutality and being in a space of of uh, openness and receptive 
uh, even with the hardships that that takes, I think for me was been profoundly inspiring. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Uh, wow, I'm now speechless, actually, uh, which is quite timely. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to really. Oh, there's no way I can express my gratitude, not only for what you've done for the summit. It's been personally a, a, a lifesaver in so many ways, um, a, transfor a tra transformative tool for my own self and my surrounding. And, but also for this time, it's been just so beautiful to finally just, you know, know more about you as a person as well and, and, and the gifts that you've brought and the gifts that you're bringing and the ones that you don't know yet that you're about to give to the world. So um, I'm in deep awe and gratitude and also to Shanti for being there supporting in, in her beautiful ways. There she is. Thank you so much, Shanti. We'd love to hear your voice before we close. Yes, please do. I sent oh, you what you've been as an observer, because you know you are the you are the the third force. You are the, exactly. the observer yes, that, that makes it possible. <laughs> I'm the one who's always there, always observing and seeing and reconciling. Huh? Allowing, but, allowing, yeah. enabling, enabling. That's it. Yes. Yes, I love that framework. Um, and I love the acknowledgement that a map is a map and the map is flat. And the world, the earth is a, is a, is a, is a sphere. So you mm. can't fall off the edge of it. So you have to know mm. what framework you're using. This was beautiful, both of you. I think, um, you know, we started off kind of talking at one point, talking about how Nuno, um, when you and Nuno met, um that what was the intention just just see what emerges and that's what i think happened here in this conversation and uh what emerged was uh, quite whole and complete um in a way that um wouldn't have been possible if we decided what was to be there at the end mm. and um and maybe we can see what emerges next. Um, I, I, um, I don't know if you've met Jewel by Strova, but I, I met her yesterday and um, she was talking about sacred activism. How do you bring sacredness to activism? And um, I know Nuno, that, that's part of what you were talking about now. Like how do you combine those two things? The, the looking in and the quiet work we have to do with ourselves, with the stuff, with the active out of out of work, and um, and how can it be rejuvenating in a way that like in a way that kind of keeps that that's regenerative and just keeps going. And um, she spoke to that a little bit with this the idea of sacred, that at any moment you can find what where your heart is being called to mm. and this this thing that you just talked about about how um meet people where they're at and allow and accept where they're at and and sacred activism in a way naturally does that because it comes from a place of love mm. and if you meet the person at where they're at and ask them what is sacred for you, it allows them to whatever stage of development they are at, to find their own meaning for themselves and without you having to push them or pull them or they can within themselves find the impetus to maybe go to the next developmental stage mm. for themselves in a way that's calling to them. So. There's so much here to explore. I, I like want to spend another like ten days just talking about all of this. Um, but Perhaps um, that's something that wants to emerge to have uh, every now and then a conversation, maybe a lot even larger with the rest of the community around how how we are how what's coming up for us and yeah. uh, as we practice and we do this work. Feels yeah, to, feels I, to I love that. Yeah, that's there's more of that coming. I'm sure. 
thank you so much, both of you, for 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 all your um, authenticity and beauty and vulnerability. And um, yes, very blessed. I think mm -hmm. I speak for everyone who is watching. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, really. Thank you, Nuno. Thank you, Shanti. Thank you, both of you. It was lovely.